Hi everyone, in today's video I am going to explain what is systematic sampling, what are the different steps involved in it, what are the advantages and disadvantages and what are the things that you should be mindful of. So let me explain what is systematic sampling in the simplest possible way. The simplest possible way is when a researcher goes through their list of participants and decides to draw out a sample by a pre-decided interval. For example, you have a list of 100 research participants and you decide that you are going to ask your questions from every 10th participant. Now this is a very simple explanation. There are more details to it. It has to be as the word itself says, systematic. That means that when you draw out sample at a pre-decided interval, you must explain why you decided on that interval. So how do you decide that interval? So you decide the interval by dividing the population size by the sample size. For example, you are standing at the exit of a university. The university has 3000 students and you want to investigate how many students feel that the university is providing skills which helps them to find jobs in the real world. Now you decide that you will at least interview 300 students. So there are, the total population is 3000 students. You decide that the sample size should at least be 300. So the population size becomes 3000 and the sample size becomes 300. So you say that every 10th student coming out of the university gates is somebody I would interview. So when you interview every 10th student and you have a population of 3000 to cover, you can pretty much cover 300 students which is your sample size. So dividing your population size by sample size gives you, the, gives you the interval at which you can choose the sample. Now remember there are some more things that you have to be mindful of. This random sampling is of course to show the examiners that you have collected data from random people and you did not pre-decide it. So you did not design your research study in a way that gets you the results that you want, the one that would support your hypothesis. So you have to show that it was completely randomized. So you cannot even start at a pre-decided level or a pre-decided participant. For example, you decide to investigate uh, in a class of 40 students, um, what are the factors that help them score high in math. So your population size may be 40, you decide to interview at least 10 students but you can't say that I'm going to start from the highest scorer and go up to the lowest scorer or even start from the lowest scorer and go to the highest scorer. Even the starting point has to be completely randomized. So what often researchers do and again these are examples I'm giving is very simple examples, uh, easy for you to understand. So to start randomly what researchers often do is that they allot numbers to their sample size or their population size actually. So if you have a population of say 40 or 50 or 100 or even 1000, then you give them numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, go on. And then you randomize the selection. So you say I can randomly start off by let's say a, a number 15 and then choose every 50th participant. So I will not start from number 1, I will start off randomly from number 15 and then choose every 50 participants. So I start with 15 then I start with 50 plus 15 is 65, the 65th participant, then 65th plus 50th participant is 115th participant. So you choose randomly. Of course, like I said, the interval is determined by dividing the population size by the sample size. Now this is where the disadvantage comes in. The disadvantage is the first one is, what if you can't define the population size? psychologists sometimes want to define or they want to collect data from as many people as possible regarding their research problem. So there are 7.2 billion people in the world. Can you define the population? So if you can't define the population, uh, defining the interval becomes very important because if you can't define the population, uh, you may have a sample size, but then how do you divide uh, unknown number by the sample size to get the interval? So that is your first disadvantage. You should be able to define the population size, be able to justify why a certain population size was chosen. The second problem is what if the students are not randomized enough, not students, sorry, research participants are not randomized enough. 
so you are trying to find out let's say that uh, what is the impact of allowing gay marriages on the society and you decide to collect your data from uh, a state uh, where there is a huge number of people uh, let's say uh, uh, conservative uh, population which have opposed the uh, gay marriage so although you may collect data from random people because you will not get randomized opinion there most of the people maybe from a conservative community that have opposed gay marriage you are not really getting the data that you need so you should be able to justify to your examiner reviewer that the data that you collected uh, from a random sample of people was indeed randomized that the population did have enough randomized people that when you randomly collected data you did get variety of data which provided you with an adequate understanding of the topic so firstly you have to define the population size and secondly you have to justify that the population had enough random people which allowed you to get variety of data but the advantage here is of course that it is easy for a researcher to understand systematic sampling you know it's a bit it's, it's easy to understand it's easy to implement if you know the population size and sample size it is easy for you to justify it to your examiner reviewer that you have randomly collected data um, uh, because the, the the if you pre-design or you you pre-design or you show in any way that you have collected data which is biased and which is only purely from the point of view of supporting your hypothesis then the examiner and reviewer will not be happy so uh, systematic sampling allows you to randomly collect data as long as you can justify the steps so normally there are steps to it like i said you know i can explain the steps the steps is firstly um, define the population size you can do that even if sometimes you are doing um, a research in psychology and you want to collect from a large number of people you can say that i am targeting uh, um, you know 3,000 people and you can justify reasons for that of course you can you can say that you know this is the population maybe you can choose a suburb that you are collecting data from you can choose a, a, a school that you are collecting data from you can choose a, a, a religion that you are collecting data from who live in a particular area so you can define the population size uh, so define the population size uh, and then uh, choose the interval by dividing the population size by the sample size so justify the sample size as well sample size is can be justified so qualitative research quantitative research has you can find many articles correlation research has articles you know for example correlation research says at least 30 participants uh, should be chosen there are many researchers of course um, there are arguments for and against it but like i said you know you can justify the sample size uh, so population size sample size is defined then divide population size by sample size get the interval uh, and then uh, give numbers to your population and then choose randomly remember that you have to start from a random point as well you can't even show that you've started at a pre-decided point and then when you collect the data you can show that you have engaged in systematic sampling uh, in my next video i will explain the difference between systematic sampling and cluster sampling um, uh, but uh, enough for now i think the video is long enough let me know if there's anything i missed any questions any points that you have any counter arguments i look forward to reading them thank you and